In this video we're going to go through the basic concepts behind creating this kind of stacked text effect that you can see here. This is where we've pocketed out two areas on a sign, so this is basically a 2D example, but it appears after we've done that that one set of text sits in front of the other. In here we're going to show you how to set the vectors up for this example, how to ensure that they're grouped together so that they're weld properly, and we'll also look at some two-tool pocketing in order to do the toolpathing for this as well. In a companion video to this we'll look at a more advanced example and also touch on concepts such as setting up templates and a file that we could go in and keep editing um, in order to create different variations on the original. So to begin we'll open a new copy of vCarve Pro. This example could be completed also in vCarve Desktop, even potentially in Cut 2D and certainly in Aspire. So let's click on the icon to create a new file. We're just going to set up a job working in inches which is 24 by 8 and we'll just make this 3 quarters of an inch thick. We'll set the uh, XY datum position in the center for the purposes of our layout and go ahead and hit OK. Now we'll create a rectangular vector for our border. So anchor point set in the center, X0, Y0. And I'm going to make this just one inch smaller than the size of the job on each side. So 23 by 7 and hit Create and Close. Next we can create the two words that will become the top layer and the bottom layer of our stacked text. So we'll come over, click on the draw text icon, I'm going to select the font trebuchet and I'm going to type in in uppercase letters Grange and then hit enter and then type the word road there. I'm going to set this in the centre, I'm going to make the text height 4 inches, hit apply and close and then I'm just going to hit F9 on the keyboard in order to centre that in the job for the moment. Now I want to adjust the spacing. You can see the R and the A here are quite close together. I want to make sure there's enough space for a tool to fit between those or at least to give us a better chance of that happening. So I'm going to click on the icon to edit text spacing and curve. I'm going to come over, I'm going to position the cursor between the R and the A and to space them out I'm going to hold the shift key down on the keyboard and then just click. And if I click again it'll space out a little more. Maybe we want space out between the A and the N there as well. And if it starts to look a little bit out of balance you may want to add a little bit more spacing between some of the other letters as well there. We'll also come down and space out the word road too. Once the spacing of my letters looks OK we can come over and click on the selection mode arrow to exit the um, text spacing tool. Now I want to select the text again and I'm going to break it into two separate lines of text that we can size individually. To do that I just need to have it selected, right mouse click and then choose the option here to break text block into lines. When we do that it's going to retain this so that it's still text, it hasn't converted it to curves but I've now got two separate pieces that I can work with here as individual lines of text and I can do that with any block of text that I've typed into the program. So let's just grab the word Grange and move that up and out the way for a moment. I'm going to select the word Road and hit F9 on the keyboard to centre it. And for this I just want to stretch these letters up so that it fills the part a little bit more. We make sure we have some difference between the word Grange and the word Road to make it easier to read the two. So for this I could either grab it, um, just click on it again to go into the transform mode and then I might come over this bottom node here, hold the shift key down to stretch around the center and just stretch that up there and so I want something around about six inches high, we'll make that just a little bit smaller. If you want to you can go in and use the set size tool to give that a very precise value. That looks okay though, so now I'm going to select the word Grange, I'm going to hit F9 to center that and this time I am going to come into the set selected object size. I'm going to make sure link XY is unchecked. I'm going to make the width of this 22 and the height 3.8 and hit apply and close. 
At this stage, we either need to know or decide which word is going to appear to be on top and which word is going to appear to be in the background. Whichever word is going to be on top will separate out so that it's on its own and then we'll weld together the top and the background letters so that we can make the text that's going to appear to be on the bottom. Now in this case I've decided that I want the word Grange to appear to be on top so I'm going to select that and I'm going to right mouse click and use the option to copy to layer. Very important you use copy and not move. Then I'm going to choose new layer and I'm going to call this layer top text. I'm going to make it invisible and inactive for a moment and hit OK. So we've made a copy of the word Grange on a layer that is now invisible. Now for the vectors that are going to represent the bottom layer of text, I need to weld together both words because I still need it to go round the word Grange to make sure that remains raised up and not cut away. But then also on the bottom layer, it's got to go round the word road as well. Now I'm not able to weld together text entities, so I would have to convert these to curves first. And then I'm going to end up with a slight problem because I'm going to lose some of the inside areas of my lettering. If I just quickly demonstrate that, if you don't follow along for this step and just watch what happens on the screen. Let's select the two sets of text. Let's choose the weld option. Software will tell me that it can't weld together the text and it's going to convert them to curves. So I'm going to say yes. Now I'm going to select all these curves. I'm going to choose the weld option, but you can see we lose a lot of the middle portions of the letter. And that's going to be a problem for me because now I'm not going to be able to machine around them. So what I'm going to do is just come in and say control Z and we'll undo that weld operation and I'll hit control Z again so I can go back to these being two separate text entities. And now what I'll show you is how we could avoid that problem. And the way we do this is by converting to curves and then grouping together each individual word. And when we weld together two groups, it'll respect those inner islands of the text. So I'm going to select the word road I'm going to click on the icon to convert objects to curves and immediately come down and click on the icon to group selected objects. Then I'm going to select the word Grange, click on the icon to convert to curves and immediately come down and group the selected objects. Now, by having both of these as groups, I can select the first one, shift and select the second one, click on the icon to weld the selected vectors and now you can see it's welded their outlines but respected those inner islands because they were both part of a group. Now while those vectors are still selected so immediately after I've done that weld operation I'm going to come over and again I'm going to click on the icon to group selected objects just to make those easier to choose when we come to do the machining in a moment. So with my group still selected I'm going to right mouse click and say move to layer, new layer, and we'll call this layer bottom text and just change the color of that layer and keep it visible and hit OK. We'll come up and we'll click. So now we've got top text here, which we can switch back on. So you can see that there. We're going to get a lot of overlapping vectors at this point, And this is why it's good to divide things up onto different layers. I'm going to take the first layer here which has got the border on it and we'll just call that layer border. So now we've got our border layer, we can change the colour of that as well if we'd like. Got our top text layer and our bottom text layer which is the basically the two words welded together. Now by putting them on layers like that it's going to make it much easier for me to select the right vectors when we come over and start calculating the toolpaths in a moment. And we can do that using the vector selector function from each of the toolpaths that we're going to use. So let's come up and click on the icon here to switch to the toolpaths tab. First thing we're going to do is set up our material for the job or at least check the material set up. Uh, it's important to mention at this point, if you do plan to actually machine this example, then you must recalculate all the toolpaths using parameters and settings that you know are safe and appropriate for your particular machine, whatever tooling you have available and the material that you plan to use. So we'll click on the set button for material setup. Here we can see we've got Z0 set off the top of the block 
three quarter inch material. If we want, we could adjust the XY datum to be in the lower left corner. We could keep that at the center as well. We can adjust our clearance and home positions to be appropriate values for the material and particular job that we're working on at the moment. And then we can go ahead and hit OK. Now from having looked at some of the gaps between the lettering on this job, I know I'm going to need to go down to a 1 8 inch diameter end mill in order to get the detail around areas, for instance, between the A and the O here. Now rather than machine the whole of each area with a 1 8, what we can do is use a pocket toolpath with two tools, where we go in with a quarter inch tool to machine out the majority of the material and then come in with an eighth just to clean up the areas that we couldn't get into with the quarter inch. So let's come up and click on the pocket toolpath icon. Start depth is going to be zero. Let's set our cut depth of our first set of text to be 0.1 of an inch going to make sure I've got show advanced toolpath options checked here so that I can see the option to use a larger area clearance tool. If you can't see that you need to come up and check the option here. I'm going to select a 8th inch end mill. In this case I don't have one in my tool database so I'm just going to make a copy of the quarter inch there. I'm going to adjust the name and the diameter there and just check the other values are appropriate. I'm going to hit apply and OK. So now we've got our 1 8 inch tool selected as our main tool and now I can check the box to use a larger area clearance tool and I'm going to select the quarter inch end mill for that and hit OK. Now I'm going to choose the raster pattern in this case. We could option to ramp if we wanted to. We can adjust things like the profile pass. In this case, I'm really not going to worry about those things and just let the software use the defaults that we happen to have selected at the moment. One thing I do want to do, though, to ensure that I select the right set of vectors is to use this vector selector here. So where it says vector selection, currently it's set to manual. I'm going to click on the selector button. And now I can choose a set of rules that the software will apply um, in order to select the vectors that I want it to. So in this case I want it to select closed vectors on a particular layer only and that is going to be on the top text layer and also the border though. So I want it to go between the border and the text that I want to appear to be in the foreground of my um, two levels. I'm going to choose the option to associate with toolpath so the software will remember that if I come back and recalculate this toolpath and if we hit close now I'm going to change the name of this toolpath to Pocket Top Text and hit Calculate. So as we'd expect, the software has automatically opened the Preview Toolpaths form and given us a 3D view. Before we look at the preview in 3D, I just want to come back up to the 2D view and I'm just going to use the option here of the Solid Preview. First of all, let's just switch off the visibility of both toolpaths. Now if we look, the first toolpath here is the one that's been calculated with the quarter inch tool. If I check the visibility for that, we can see it's doing a pretty good job of machining around all my lettering there. If I choose the solid option, I can see how much of that material is going to be cleared away. So that's this option right down in the far right here. By toggling that on and off, you can change the visibility from the lines and arrows to the software actually shading in the areas that will be machined. Now if we zoom in, to the 2D view here, you can see where the radius of the tool is not going to get into the corners. And so if I just hit F on the keyboard to just fit the view then, if we switch off the clear and look at what the 8th inch tool is doing, that's just being sent in to profile round all the vectors in order to give me nice tight radii. So if we look at the combination of the two, we can see we're really getting in to the corners with the 8th inch tool and the quarter inch is efficiently clearing out the rest of the material. So a couple of things to note there. One, what this two tool pocketing does and also the solid preview. Very, very useful function for 2D toolpaths to see exactly what they're doing in the 2D view. Now I'm going to come back to the 3D view and what I want to do is just change some of the, my colour settings here. So for the material, I'm going to choose a solid colour and I'm going to select here a kind of a, a um, I guess a sort of a, a mid blue here or this sort of light blue. And then for the toolpath, I'm going to come into the toolpath colour and we'll select 
a sky blue here. So let's take a look at that. First, let's preview what the quarter inch tool is doing. Now I can see I've got both colors. Oh, I don't, did not select the color there. There we go. So we can see what the uh, color is doing there or what the quarter inch tool is doing there. And now we can select the eighth inch tool and preview that. And we can see in this case, it just tightens up those corners. So that's my top layer of text. Now we need to go in a machine around Grange again, but also now around the word road as well. So if we close this, we can tile the windows. So I'm going to hit page down on the keyboard. That's the shortcut key to tile. So I see the windows at the top and the bottom of the screen. Now I'm just going to select my pocket toolpath again. This time I've already cut down 0.1 of an inch. So I'm going to set the start depth to be 0.1 leave the cut depth at 0.1 so that'll give me a combined cut depth of 0.2 of an inch. The tooling is going to remain the same, in fact I'm going to leave all the same settings, the only thing I'm going to change is which vectors are selected. So I'm going to click on the selector button and this time I want the border still selected for the layers but I want to change top text to bottom text. Again I'm going to associate that with the toolpath so now we've got border and bottom text. I'm going to hit close. We'll call this pocket bottom text. Hit the calculate button. And now you can see there what that's going to be machining. So now if we look in the 2D view here, again, if we just switch off, you can see now there are a number of areas that the quarter inch would not have been able to get into. If I just zoom in there, you can see it would have left material in all these areas that are still white on here. And that's why it's important in this case, again, that we've got the eighth inch there. And you can see when we switch on that, that it's clearing out and into those areas. So the combination of the two should give me exactly what I'm looking for. Now, in this case, I'm going to choose my toolpath color to be white there. And I need to make sure it's selected for both toolpaths. That's what I didn't do before here. So again, you've got to make sure you select each individual toolpath and change its toolpath color setting there. And now, with those both selected, so with both of those uh, with the check mark there, meaning they're visible, I can click on the icon here to say preview visible toolpaths and the software will show me the result of those two. So now you can see in the 3D view that we've got this idea of one set of text sitting on top of the other. So let's save the file. So you've got an example of this. I'm going to say file save as and in the project folder we'll just call this simple stacked text and hit save. So this example has just been designed to show you the basics of this concept of doing this stacked text where you've got some words that appear to be in the front and some that appear to be in the background. The main things to remember are the fact that we took a copy of the top text, so the text we wanted in the foreground, put that onto a separate layer, and then for the text we wanted to appear in the background, we needed to weld that together with the top text. In order to weld it, I had to convert it to curves and then group each set before we used the weld command in order to make sure it respected those inner islands. Next, we've made sure that we manage our vectors using the layers so that we had a layer with the top text, a layer with the bottom text and a separate layer with our border on it. And then we were able to use those when we calculated the toolpaths with the vector selector to make sure we were getting the right set of vectors for each toolpath without having to manually select them from the 2D view. The other thing we looked at in this example is how we can use a two tool pocket toolpath to make sure that the smaller tool will allow us to get into any gaps we need to. On the other example we're going to show you with the stack text where we set up a template file, we're actually going to use a vbit um, two tool to toolpath which will give us a slightly different effect. So if you want to see something a little bit more advanced it'll be worth watching that video next if you haven't already. That concludes this example.